grace and mercy and peace be yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. We turn our attention to today's epistle lesson which began, But you, O man of God, flee from these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life to which you were called and about which you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Dear friends in Christ, love God, love people has become a very popular tagline for churches nowadays. And it's a good summary of the law. When Jesus would ask, was asked, what's the greatest commandment? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Personally, though, as an evangelical Lutheran, I wouldn't want that to be the tagline for our church because while it summarizes the law, one of the two main doctrines of the Bible, it doesn't contain any of the more important of the two main teachings of the Bible, the gospel, that we are saved by grace alone through Jesus. Maybe a better tagline would be sharing God's love with people. It's a popular tagline, though, because, of course, the word love is a wonderful, friendly sounding word. Love is a great thing, right? I don't think anybody would disagree with that. I'm 100% also in favor of God's commandments. <laughs> His commandments summarized as love God and love people. And now that we're on the topic, our readings do make a point about keeping God's law of love, love God, and love people. Let's expand the two greatest commandments as Jesus put them back into their original Ten Commandment form, the kind they were, the way they were written on those tablets that Moses wound up smashing as he came down the mountain. Remember the commandments about loving God? You shall have no other gods beside me. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. And you shall remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And then love your neighbor. Honor your father and mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal and so on. In effect, what Jesus was highlighting in our gospel lesson this morning is that first commandment. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. In other words, love God, then love people in that order. And sometimes there are very tough choices involved in that. That's why Paul's encouragement to Timothy in our epistle lesson contains some fighting words. Fight the good fight of faith. Moses fought the good fight of the faith. We see that in today's Old Testament lesson. Moses loved God, and God loved Moses. God invited Moses up Mount Sinai, where he would personally experience God's presence. There God carved out the first copy of the Ten Commandments about loving God and loving people. What a wonderful experience that was for Moses. Can you imagine being in the midst of a theophany with God on the top of the mountain? What a high. And then he comes down the mountain and what does he find? 
the people in the midst of a wild party around a golden calf that his own brother had made out of earrings and nose rings that they had plundered from the Egyptians. It was a time for some serious law preaching by Moses. And he loudly called them to repentance. When Moses saw that the people were out of control, for Aaron had let them get so out of control that they were disgraced among their enemies, Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Whoever is on the Lord's side, come to me. One might have hoped that they all would have come over to Moses' side. After all, he was the man who had led them out of slavery in Egypt, led them on dry ground through the Red Sea, led them as he himself followed the pillar of cloud by day and pillar of fire by night as they made their way to the promised land. But no, they did not all come to Moses. Only some did. What was Moses to do? God had established the Israelites apart from all nations on earth to be his employees, so to speak, to carry out a, a task of eternal and worldwide significance. Their job was to preserve the promise of the Savior of the whole world. The only one who could save everybody from sin and death was to come from their number and they were to preserve the word and the promise. So was Moses now to lead a religiously divided group? to the promised land, a land where some of them wanted to hold on to the promise and the word, and some despised it and said, no, we're going to have adulterous parties to a golden calf. It would have been impossible for Israel to be God's chosen people. God himself had said, this is going to be a special nation. You will be my kingdom of priests and a holy nation. It's for that reason that we hear of the gruesome scene that followed. Moses told those who were faithful to the Lord to cut down those who hated the Lord from among his chosen people. And they were all relatives. They were all neighbors. They could not be part of his kingdom of priests while rejecting God and worshiping a golden calf. And then Jesus told his disciples too that there would be times when they would have to choose between loyalty to God and loyalty to relatives. I did not come to bring peace but a sword, he warned. Some years later, as Paul carried the gospel to new lands, he trained and ordained pastors to carry out the work of the ministry. One of them was Pastor Timothy, and Paul warns him also that sometimes being a faithful Christian involves fights. Elsewhere, Paul explains, though, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the world rulers of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil. And so today, he tells Timothy, be prepared to fight the good fight of the faith. In addition to the fight that all Christians carry out daily against the devil, the world, and their own sinful flesh, pastors like Timothy need to do the sometimes thankless job of warning the people entrusted to their oversight of the dangers of false teaching. Hence, the texts that have been appointed for our readings the last three weeks. Believe me, when I 
look at the lectionary and say, oh, some more stuff from Matthew 9 and 10 this week. I cringe too. I can't wait to get to something more positive. And here's a spoiler alert. Uh, Matt Brooks will get to preach to you from Matthew 11 next week where Jesus says, come unto me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. But Jesus spoke all these words, the tough ones and the ones that fall so gently on our ears. Paul and Timothy and Moses and every other pastor in history is required to preach the whole counsel of God. Why? Because we need to fight the good fight of faith. Paul began his exhortation to Timothy with these words, but you, O man of God, flee from these things. What things? Paul names them naturally in the verses right before our text. If anyone teaches different doctrines and does not devote himself to the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to godly teaching, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. Instead, he has a morbid craving for controversies and battles over words, things that produce envy, strife, abusive language, evil suspicions, and constant frictions among people whose minds are depraved, who have lost hold of the truth, imagining that their godliness is a means to financial gain. Separate yourselves from such people. Just as Moses could not take those who rejected God's clear word along on the journey to the promised land, neither can the church in the New Testament. The New Testament church is not an ethnic group of relatives like Old Testament Israel was. The church of Jesus Christ is made up of people of every nation, tribe, people, and language. But these diverse people are united. Members of the church of Jesus are completely united in understanding the love of God, the gospel of Jesus that gives us the free gift of eternal life by washing away our sins. And then the people of the New Testament church are united as a result in obedience to God's word. That can't exist. It can't coexist together with, as Paul puts it, constant frictions among people whose minds are depraved, who have lost hold of the truth. What can and must exist among Christians united in fighting the good fight of the faith, Paul says here, O man of God, flee from these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Pursue righteousness. Righteousness is the gift of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Through the gospel in word and sacraments, God washes away our sins. He wipes us clean of sin with the blood of Jesus Christ, forgiven and renewed by God. Then we can pursue godliness, which means we strive to live for God each day. We work now at loving God and loving people. Pursue faith, Paul says. We pursue faith by not neglecting the Bible. Have you found this to be true? That there are days when you think to yourself, I just don't have time to read my meditations. I just don't have time today to do my Bible reading. And your day suffers as a result. And your godliness suffers as a result. And your faith suffers. But then those days when you do read, when you do spend some time with the Word of God, it changes 
everything. Your faith is built up. And now you can pursue the next thing in Paul's list, love. We love God first and then people. And sometimes true love for people means telling them how important love for God is. Sometimes people don't want to hear that. But true love doesn't shy away from telling the truth. And it can be tough, which is why the next thing in Paul's list is perseverance. Pursue perseverance. Stick with it. And do it all with, as Paul says, gentleness. The gentleness that comes from knowing God is in control and God loves you because you're righteous and forgiven through faith. That was Paul's advice to Pastor Timothy, but that's not just advice for pastors. That's advice for every single Christian. Why do it? Why run away from what's evil? And why pursue persistently what is good? Paul says, because that's how we take hold of eternal life. Take hold of eternal life to which you were called and about which you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Every Christian confesses their faith with the mouth. Timothy made a good confession, a public confession of his faith when he was confirmed. You know, as a child, Timothy sat on the laps of his grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice, who taught him the word of God from childhood on up. Remember what Paul wrote elsewhere to him? From infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation. Those two wonderful women, grandmother and mother, taught the word of God to Timothy, and then Paul taught him more thoroughly. And finally, Paul completed his instruction as a theologian and a pastor, after which Timothy once again made a good confession before many witnesses when he was ordained and hands were laid on him and the pastoral ministry was conferred upon him at his ordination. We communicant members of the church have also all made a public confession. We also have taken confirmation vows. We've promised to remain faithful to the one true faith until death, whether captured by Muslims and tortured to death or insulted by neighbors and relatives. If we remain faithful to our public confession, then we too will take hold of eternal life. Some make that confession, you know, and fall away. Some of you who were confirmed many years ago know people who stood on these very steps and made those vows here. And it's been years since they've ever darkened the door of any church, much less this one. What a sad thing. But those who made those vows seriously and took those vows seriously and pursued righteousness, godliness, faith, perseverance, love, and gentleness are still confessing Jesus and are far stronger in their faith today. By taking that public confession seriously, they are making their calling and election sure, as scripture says. Inspired by daily doses of gospel forgiveness, they then love God and love people. Be part of that group and take hold of eternal life. Amen.